welcome everybody this is the next talk very interesting topic the history of malware from floppies to droppers please welcome iliad kinmu thank you thank you all right thank you so much for coming so uh, this is going to be the history of malware. My name is Elliot Kimchi. I'll have a who am I slide at the end, but there's a lot to cover, so we'll move quickly. So today we're going to take a journey through time and space. I think it's really important to understand, especially people who work in security research, in any area of security, really important to understand where these things come from, the motivations. Um, how do we get to the point today um, and, and how did it all evolve? How do we get to the point where we are today with malware? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about when some of the first phenomenons uh, that we understand today in malware, when did they first happen? We're going to talk about what happened, who are the people behind it, what were their motivations, and sometimes where they came from. And that's going to be really interesting. Before we start, I'll start with a question. And this is common grounds, and somebody told me that I need, to, we, we should do some sort of a, there should be some discussion. So I'll, I'll ask some questions. Um, the first question is, uh, when was the first ransomware incident? Yeah. 1989. 1989, very good. A round of applause. Uh, do you, do you want to, do you, do you know the details? Yes, well, very well done. So the AIDS Trojan, or the uh, PC Cyber was the name of the company, but uh, in 1989, the first ransomware incident. That's really funny and kind of weird for a couple of reasons. One is 1989, uh, there's people in this room that weren't born in 1989, I imagine. Um, I was born shortly before, so this really predates a lot of things, and also, like, really? Ransomware 1989? Was the technology there to enable this? And this is a real story. And I mean, I think uh, for starters, it took a lot of creativity and a lot of determination to actually make ransomware in 1989. Um, there was a guy called Joseph L. Pope. He had this brilliant idea. Um, what if he could create software that basically blackmails people into paying him? And he thought, this is great. This is a fantastic idea. He took 20,000 floppy disks, which is a huge investment, uh, financial investment. Yeah, each one would go in an envelope. He would send it by mail to people all over the world. Oh, actually, most of them were in the UK. Um, if you ran it, it asked you to turn on your printer, because back then, ransomware wasn't paperless yet. You know, So it would print out the invoice, which is also the ransom note. and. Uh, yeah, it would lock up your computer. After a while, it would ask you to pay. Um, you, was, you were supposed to send money to a P.O. box in Panama because of the genius uh, that he was. He thought he could just go on vacation immediately after. Um, and it was a really, really interesting incident. First of all, the, the malware itself, the Trojan itself, had some, it wasn't super sophisticated, but it was really clever. One thing that it did is it would fake an MS-DOS environment. So it basically would create this MS-DOS environment which you couldn't escape out of. Um, control out delete would just return you to that environment. Uh, restarting would just return you to that environment. You would basically, you're supposed to think that you're locked out of your computer. In the back uh, or behind the scenes, it would encrypt files. It was an XOR encryption. It would change the names of the files and that would create, uh, uh, it would make it really hard for you to access your information. This had impact in a lot of different ways similar to where we see impact today with ransomware. Um, a lot of people back in 1989 didn't really know how to recover from something like this. There were AIDS researchers that had lost reportedly 10 years of their research. And it was also partly the impact that it caused was the reason that Joseph L. Pope uh, kind of went crazy. Uh, towards the, the sort of uh, later part of his life. And it, it, I read a lot of different accounts, uh, but some of them say that he was just so ridden with guilt when he'd heard of what he had uh, caused that he was in, a, in an airport in Amsterdam and he passed on a note to law enforcement, something along the lines of Doc, Dr. Joseph L. Pope is uh, not well, or something to that effect. They caught him, they tried him, he would show up in court with like curlers in his beard, hats made out of uh, cardboard, I think, 
and he was completely insane. And they let him go because he was crazy. Maybe he was crazy before, I don't know. But uh, he was certainly crazy after. And that was the first ransomware. And this was a Trojan, and we'll come back. Trojans will make a, a, a great comeback towards, uh, towards the latter part of this talk. But really to start talking about um, malware and malware writers, we have to sort of put ourselves, let's journey through time and try to understand what computers meant to people in the 70s and 80s. And there was this sense of wonder, fascination. Computers were this magical thing that could enable uh, uh, everything that we could imagine. Uh, when you look at pop culture, and sci-fi in particular, computers were this thing that would make science happen, that would make magic happen. Uh, they would be the thing that would take you to space or teleport you, or at least enable these things to happen. There were some, some films where it was the main character, like War Games or Tron, things like that. And so there was this sense of wonder, and in that sort of environment, you have a lot of people sort of theorizing, and they're sort of fascinated with these ideas of what could happen on a computer. And in 1984, there was a man called Alexander Dudney. He wrote a column for the Scientific American. Um, he wrote about a game that he created. The game was called Core Wars, and the whole premise was, you know, what if there were two programs on a computer and they just fight each other? They can copy themselves, they can think, they can attack each other. You write the code and then you let it loose. You know, so it's kind of like battle bots but without chainsaws. Um, and they would fight it out and wh whoever wins, wins. And he, he says I was inspired by this story that I heard. He says this, this fantastical story, this myth um, about the reaper and the creeper. He says somewhere uh, uh, in the 70s there was a lab and some scientists created this virus called the creeper. And it spread throughout the lab and it infested everything and they couldn't get rid of it until they wrote another virus that went and spread again and then all it did was look for copies of the first virus and delete them uh, and delete itself. And he thought, you know, there's some obvious holes in this story and it's a bit of a, you know, it's a weird kind of story. Um, but what if it could be true? What if it was true? And that's why he created his game. Um, but back in 84, there was no uh, real uh, awareness of what viruses were. So he asked his readers to send him some, uh, some of their creations. And what he got instead is a whole lot of virus, uh, uh, evidence of virus creators, uh, all sorts of virus that people uh, uh, encountered. So a year later he writes of worms, viruses, and other creatures. He writes this column again, and there he tells people all over the world about viruses actually existing. What he had considered a myth was actually a reality. And this was a surprise to a lot of people. Um, what I'd heard is, is really this wasn't commonly discussed because Nobody really wanted to hinder the sales of computers. That's one thing that I had read. But in mid-80s, despite viruses having existed for a long time, they were still considered something of a myth. And maybe, maybe some people in the audience can confirm or deny this. But in 1989, he writes another column. He starts that with uh, a quote from Eugene Speffert, something along the lines of, the only safe computer is one that is turned off, cast in a cement block, put in a safe room and guarded with live guards, and even then I have my doubts. So by four years later, he, everybody understands the danger of what can happen with, with computers. And it's interesting to see this transition, and we're going to talk about a little bit why this happens. And by the way, the story that he's thinking about, that myth is real, and I encourage everybody to, to kind of research this. Uh, in 1971, there was a lab called BBN Labs, uh, B BBN Labs, BBN Labs. In Massachusetts, it was a name by a uh, man by the name of Bob Thomas. He wrote the Creeper. They were trying to create software that would replicate itself to create backups for itself. Uh, systems weren't always, uh, you know, fail-proof. Sometimes they would crash. So how do you back something up? Well, you move it, you copy it to another machine. So he ran this experiment, and he was a little whimsical. So he created this thing that would replicate onto another computer, and to know that it success uh, successfully. Uh, replicated, it would put on the screen, I am the creeper, catch me if you can. It's a really cool story. Um, later on, they created the Reaper, which was a, a same concept, but it was meant to delete the creeper. Um, 
And I don't think it went out of control. I think it was a controlled environment from what I've read. So it wasn't this fantastical story, but it did happen. So we're not going to talk. This is, we're not going to do background for much longer, but I do want to talk a little bit about what happened with technology around that time in the 80s and the 90s. Personal computers came on the scene. 1977 were the first three personal computers, the Apple II, the TRS-80, and the Commodore PET. Really, really important uh, fact for, for malware writers. Um, IBM came into the scene in 1981 uh, with their PC. And this was the first time where people actually had access, for a lot of people, to computers. Uh, and with great access comes uh, uh, no responsibility and lots of, lots of power. And uh, people started writing viruses. And they started seeing them in the office, in their homes. And the other thing that was happening is the, sort of the creation of the sneaker net. Um, there were portable medium, portable storage devices you could actually take and put into another computer. So this was a boon and a curse for virus writers and a huge influence on what we're about to look at. Because now you could actually transfer your, your virus from one computer to another, powered by the power of shoes and people walking around. And that was great, because you could spread it. And the curse was that those shoes were connected to a thinking, living, living human being that had to actually want to pass this along. So you had to be stealthy. They, should, they couldn't know that they were infected. Or maybe uh, you make something really funny and whimsical um, that they would want to show their friends. And these are some of the early, this is, these are viruses from sort of the early 80s. Uh, some of them are from the later part of the 80s, but a lot of the early viruses were experimental. They were whimsical. Um, they did things like write peace on earth on your computer, or I am the hyper avenger, uh, Dukakis for president, uh, peace on earth and love for everyone. Or they would do these things like the cascade virus here, which would create this visual effect. And a lot of them were harmless. But if you weren't really paying attention, then things would start happening. And maybe you didn't know really how to, how to handle this. And all of them had these different messages or different effects. Uh, I read somewhere it, it had this uh, silly sort of look what I can do bravado uh, rather than sheer hostility. And it was cool. I mean, I think we could think of it more as graffiti. You know, you're not really trying to knock down the wall. You're trying to cover it. It's vandalistic a little bit, but it's, it's interesting. Has anybody here ever experienced a virus like that? You want, you want to share or you want to tell a story? Or? Yeah, and these, these things would spread. And that's really, really interesting, because you, wouldn't, you might not imagine something that can only travel by floppy to actually get to a lot of different places. But we'll start seeing these viruses spread later on. I want to talk about one specific one, and that's Elk Cloner. And maybe, maybe really talk about what were the inspiration. Elk Cloner was written by a man called Richard Scranton. Um, Scranton and he got his first Apple computer in the seventh grade, and he was in love. By the ninth grade, he was uh, pirating games for his friends and playing little pranks. So he would pirate a game, and he would put a kill switch in there. And after four or five times it ran, the game would delete itself. And so his friends would play the game, they would get hooked, and then the game would delete itself. And he loved it. He was just laughing his ass off and just enjoying the whole thing. And his friends did not like it at all, and they stopped taking floppy disks from him. So he started thinking, what can I do to, to infect people, to continue to play pranks. So he decided he's going to make some sort of sticky um, software. And I, I don't know what you were doing when you were in ninth grade. Uh, I wasn't writing brilliant viruses for, for a brand new sort of technology. But he was. And so he decided he was going to create, it was a, a boot sector virus. A lot of the viruses back then were boot sector viruses. And the virus, if you put a floppy disk that had this virus on it, put it into the computer. It would copy itself to the boot sector, and it would run every time you run the computer. It would also infect other floppy disks. Um, that's just sort of the simplified version of that. So Richard wrote this virus um, and continued to prank his friends. Um, and generally speaking, a lot of these viruses worked similar to this. Um, they would sort of append themselves to the end of the program. They would hijack the command to start, sort of start, start the program. 
uh, that was running, and they would run the virus code, and then they would jump back to the program. So you basically think you're running a program, but you're running the virus as well. They would use these uh, interrupts. This is from MS-DOS. These are the kind of like system calls. You could use them to do all sorts of things. And you would hook onto that, um, basically. Nowadays, I think, uh, obviously, we don't use MS-DOS, but there's other things that we hook onto. There's other uh, system calls that we use. So this is something that is very similar to, maybe in some ways similar to what we do today. However, uh, boot sector viruses, things like that, we don't see a lot anymore. We do see malware that infects the ma master boot uh, record, like Petya, um, but there's not a lot of them that do that. So those are sort of the, some of the earlier viruses. But something happens. We know that malware uh, becomes malicious. We know because mal, malicious. Uh, but the question is uh, why and when. And it's really hard to pinpoint. But uh, somewhere in the mid-'80s, we start to see news stories all over the place about the computer virus. And this sort of builds both attention and hype about what could happen on your computer, and also it builds the anxiety, the general anxiety of people. This kind of starts with this virus called the brain virus. And what's interesting about the brain virus, first of all, it infected a news organization, the Providence Journal, and then so it got a lot of coverage. The other thing is it came from Pakistan. And nobody knew how a virus came from Pakistan and made it all the way to the US on a floppy disk. Nobody knew how it got there. Nobody knew how it, it uh, infected tens of thousands of floppy disks. It wasn't particularly malicious, but it was enigmatic. And with this enigma, you get a lot of uh, uh, buzz. There was also people writing uh, books about viruses, like Das Großen Computerweinbuch in Germany, telling you how to build a virus. And then you start to see viruses that are a lot more malicious, that are a lot more destructive, like the casino virus. Uh, or the Maltese Casino from 1991. This one was pretty nasty. It would copy uh, your file allocation table to the memory. It would hold on to that while it deleted it. So your computer doesn't know where your files are or doesn't know how to access, basically deleting your, your, your hard drive. And it would make you play a game. It's a, it's a little um, slot machine. If you get three pound signs, you would get your memory, you, you would get your data back. If you didn't, you didn't get your data back. And if you get three question marks where it says it, it will give you his phone number, and he says something along the lines of, screw you, why are you trying to track me down? As punishment, I'm going to delete your files anyway, and delete your files. So you have this Maltese casino coming from Malta. You have like the Vienna virus. Uh, you know, Oddly enough, researched in Bulgaria. You have uh, uh, the Italian virus. You have the Israeli virus, Jerusalem virus, 1987. This was a virus that was designed to uh, activate its payload and delete everything on Friday the 13th, uh, 1988. Or sorry, every year after 1987. Because it was created in 1987, and they wanted to have a year to sort of try and infect as much as it can. And these things would create these panics. Michelangelo was another panic because they would be found before the day that they were supposed to, um, to infect, or before the day they were supposed to activate their payload. So people didn't know if they were the, a victim to something like that. If on the day, 20th of January, uh, 1988, are all of the computers around the world going to be deleted or not? It was kind of like a Y2K um, sort of panic every, every few, few years. One of my favorite viruses, though, I want to talk about is the one half virus, and I'll just talk shortly about that. Um, this was a destructive one. This is towards uh, the later period of what we're talking about here, 1994. But already there's a lot of sophistication. So one half doesn't just jump into the entire virus uh, code and then jumps back to the software. It actually splits itself up to different functions and then distributes it itself inside the program that it tries to infect. It looks for empty sectors in that program and just attaches itself. And it would jump from one instruction to another. And this is a form of polymorphism or metamorphism. And this is MS-DOS. This is in 1994. So that was one thing that was interesting. Pretty, pretty clever. Uh, the other thing is it would encrypt itself and decrypt itself on the fly because it didn't want to be discovered or, or, or um, by, by antivirus software. Um, it would also look for the names of antivirus software in the software that it's trying to encrypt or trying to infect. And it, 
it wouldn't infect, so it would watch out for antivirus. So this is pretty clever for the time. And what it would do is it would start encrypting your hard drive, slowly encrypting. Every reboot would encrypt a little bit more. Um, and you wouldn't know it because it would also decrypt it on the fly. So as you're uh, um, trying to reach into that, it would start decrypting your, your memory and then encrypting it again. And you have no idea until one day it pops up a message that says, this is one half. And by that point, a bunch of your memory or a bunch of your hard drive is encrypted. And when your hard drive is encrypted and the only thing that decrypts it is this virus, then you have a problem because you can't delete it. But you also don't want to know, maybe you don't want to live with this on your computer. It's really strange. And I don't know, I thought, I thought it was fascinating, this type of parasitic relationship between you and, a, and malware. Um, it didn't do anything else. So technically, you could just live with it if you wanted to. So this was the world of early viruses. Um, we have Trojans and worms that are also making their first appearance. We talked about the AIDS Trojan. Uh, Morris worm, I'm not going to tell the whole story of the Morris worm because we're going to talk about worms a little bit later. But 1988, this is another big story in the news. Um, Robert Morris writes this worm. He has this idea, if I could make a software that copies itself into other computers on the uh, early days, the very early days of ARPANET internet kind of. Um, if I can send this to all of the contacts, if I can make it send itself, use a couple of vulnerabilities and also uh, something that would sort of uh, uh, guess passwords. And he figured if I could do that, I could spread my, uh, my software everywhere I want. Um, and he did it, and it infected 6,000 computers, which at the time was 10% of the entire internet. Um, and it was a big story. And everybody forgot about that until the next worm comes around. So <laughs> this is another trend that you'll notice. Things happen, and then we forget and then they happen more seriously. But now we arrive at the mid-90s. And why is it important? Why is this an important time? Well, first of all, in pop culture, we also understand, already understand what, what uh, uh, hackers are. We kind of start to get an idea, although it's still a lot of clickety-clack. And you know, I'm in the mainframe. Um, but also, we have two wonderful things happen. Um, we have Windows 95, which before that came out, uh, Microsoft said that they're, that, uh, Viruses are not going to work on Windows 95. And so that is the end of my talk, actually. They never worked again. <laughs> but uh, it was probably it was a marketing person that said that. But um, yeah, uh, Windows 95 had a lot of uh, other convenient ways to activate, to, to work with uh, for malware. And more importantly, Office 95. And Office 95 had this great new feature, macros. You heard of macros? And macros, this was this kind of cool feature that uh, somebody at Microsoft thought about. And well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk about it this way. But macros basically uh, gave you the option to automate some functions whenever you uh, uh, were working with an Office file. And so you would automate, maybe you could open things, close things. You can run debug commands. You can run commands on, on, on Windows. You could do a whole lot. And because you could do a whole lot, people started thinking about how this could be abused. So the first ever macro virus um, was the concept virus. Came out maybe a month after Windows, uh, after Office uh, 95 came out. And macro was super, super simple. You open a Word file, the macro runs. It tells the computer to display this. You press OK, and then nothing happens. It was literally a proof of concept. Um, so nobody cared. And then macro, and then, and then concept was, uh, you know, and when it came out, it was maybe the fourth uh, most infectious virus. And then it became uh, the second. And then a month later, it was the first. And then it was the first. And then three years later, all of the viruses were macro viruses. And that became a really popular uh, technique. But we're talking about macro viruses. Macro viruses ha haven't gone anywhere. We're still seeing macros being used for phishing. This is still an effective way, of, or in the past, uh, uh, let's say, 10 years, has been a very effective way of um, being able to run commands on a computer, PowerShell, or anything like that. So you're looking basically at some sort of prehistoric, like a shark, something that, that uh, uh, has this ultra predator from, from 25 years ago 
that still haunts to this day. So macro viruses throughout the, the late 90s continued to evolve, and we actually start to see the same trend. They were experimental, then they were whimsical, then they were destructive. Um, this is one of these experimental viruses. This was written by a guy called uh, Nightmare Joker, and he was a famous virus writer at the time. They were like rock star virus writers uh, back in those days. Um, he was super famous, he wrote some kits, but he also wrote this. This is interesting for a couple of reasons. When you uh, run the document, it would run the macro. The macro would copy itself to the global macros, which means it starts to infect all your other documents whenever you open them, um, or when you create a new one. It would also obfuscate the names of the macros because, like I said, uh, when Concept came out, nobody really did anything about macroviruses. By the time antivirus caught up to this trend, they were just looking for names of macros. So a virus writer would just obfuscate the name, create a, generate a name on the spot. So it would create these macros, and it, they had a very specific purpose. Um, on a specific date, uh, they would activate. And when they activate on that specific day, it was January 20th, I believe, um, it would basically hijack your screen. It would say, uh, you are infected with outlaw, a virus from Night or Joker. Behind the scenes, it would run debug commands. It would create a file, generate a binary file, and change it to a, a wave file, a sound file. That sound file was the sound of someone laughing. So if you press the wrong key, which is what's the E key, on January 20th, your computer would get hijacked and it would start laughing at you. Um, kind of a prehistoric dropper of sorts, and really, really creepy, uh, if you ask me. Um, and macroviruses just continued to evolve during those days. Now, remember the worm, the Morris worm from earlier? Back then, the internet was maybe uh, 60,000 machines. By 1999, the internet was uh, 250 million machines. So, we start to see the first emergence of these big worm infections. So Melissa uh, is a macrovirus that had taken on a worming uh, capability. So instead of doing something like delete your entire computer, or instead of doing something like laugh at you, it opens Outlook, and then it sends itself to uh, 50 contacts, the first 50 contacts that it can find. And then when it lands on the, other, on the next computer, uh, hopefully somebody opens the, the, uh, the file, it would send itself to 50 more people. And Melissa spread so quickly and so uh, uh, thoroughly that in 1999, this virus shut down 300 companies uh, where they had to shut down their emails, shut down the communication, including IBM, Microsoft, and a lot of other companies. And it made huge, huge news all over the world. Um, they, they, this, the FBI got involved, they actually caught the guy. But this was the, this was a new era. This ushers in something really, really important. For the first time we have a, maybe not the first time, but, but the first time with a major, major impact, we have a macro virus that can worm itself to other computers. And this was an important step in the evolution of, of malware. Um, after the Melissa virus, uh, we see the, I, we, we find the I love you virus uh, uh, one year later, and this one was a lot more destructive. Had some destructive capabilities, it could change files, it could change the, the uh, it could hide files, and there were variants that would delete files, and it would cause a lot more damage. But from that point on, we start to see these types of um, worming viruses, and we kind of move into the 2000s. And the 2000s bring with them a lot more ways for us to communicate with each other. And that's sort of the technological influence of that time that it brings onto malware. We've got Kaza, we've got uh, IRC and AIM. And malware would spread through all of these channels. Macroviruses would spread through all of these channels, and we'll maybe talk about why. But also IRC was super, super important at the time because it provided, it ended up being some sort of, uh, um, a uh, consolidated point for control, and we'll talk about control of, of what exactly. Well, we talked about Trojans, and we kind of forgot about Trojans, and now we're coming back to the Trojan. So there were these evolutions, the, the Kazaa and, and all these things, it meant that 
Actually, it, it, it makes more sense for you to send somebody a file and tell them that this is the new Britney Spears album um, and for them to, to run that file than to try and send them a Word document with a macro on it. So suddenly we start to see this, this uh, um, decline of macro viruses and we see a lot more Trojans pop in. So we start to see macro viruses being compiled, the macro script is getting compiled into a file and then they tell you it's some kind of a, a, a pirated uh, or maybe it, it's a, a crack for your favorite game um, but it actually contains both the crack and the virus and you get infected without knowing. Another thing is happening uh, at the same time. Um, we start to see these types of remote access uh, Trojans or uh, remote administration tools, however you want to call it. The abbreviation is the same. And the idea is that now you have computers networking for the first time, computer and networking en masse. And so you have administrators and administrators uh, do need to administrate uh, and they need something to help them control computers. Um, but at the same time, you have this sort of, uh, on the other side of this coin, you have these remote access Trojans, which the whole point, it starts out with Netbus in 1980, 1998. And Netbus was created by a Swedish man. Bus in Swedish is uh, mischief. So this was supposed to be a prank or a joke. Um, and it would basically create a connection between two computers. You have one computer that's infected, and the other computer is controlling it. One is the server, the other is the client. And the client can send commands over to the, the controlled uh, computer. It could open the CD-ROM or it could do all sorts of fun things like play a fart sound. Awesome. That same year we have Cult of the Dead Cow, a group of very famous hackers, released back Orifice. That was in Black Hat, 1998. Um, back Orifice did the ex similar concept only that was uh, uh, allowed you to do a lot more. You could do a lot more than just make funny sounds. You could delete somebody's computer. You could key log. You could look through their camera. You could listen in on what they're doing. Um, and that opened the door for a lot more that you could do with these remote access Trojans. In 1999, we get Sub7, a script kitty mecha. Um, which enabled you a lot more things and also eventually included the connection, the ability to connect to an IRC server or IRC channel where you can control script, uh, uh, you can control sub seven. And you know, I, I said script kitty and I know we deride script kitty in, in, for some, in some ways justifiably, but I want you to try and imagine being 15 year old, years old and having that, that type of power I think, like I said, with great access comes absolutely no responsibility and great power. And, and I think a lot of people just went that route because it seemed like some kind of grand adventure um, that they could do. I don't think that justifies anything, but I just think it's, it's interesting. So these would act as inspiration um, for, for malware writers in, in the 2000s. And suddenly, Malware is starting to get a purpose. Because up until now, we get these things that make fun of you, or they do some silly thing, or they delete your files. But here we can do so much more, and that opens up the door for a lot of different things. So what happened when you combine this with the worming viruses? Well, you get macro viruses that can worm to a lot of other computers, and then they could install some backdoor or they can put some backdoor in capability. And when you put a backdoor on a computer, they can do whatever they want with that computer. You could, uh, a lot of the early ones would uh, use it to send spam. So you would have this, these macro viruses. Some of them would act like downloaders. So some, of, some viruses going all the way back to 1999, the way they would operate is they would connect to a, a website online or a server online, and they would download the rest of the payload. This, is, this goes all the way to macro viruses. Um, they would update themselves, they would download modules from the internet, and they basically would spread through email, IRC, messenger, anything they could find, and sometimes drive by downloads and they would install a backdoor. So we start to see this happening in the early part of the 2000s, and this is for the formation of the first botnets. So botnets would start to become more popular. Um, the idea was that you could 
um, create a bunch of slave computers. You either install a proxy on them or you install a backdoor, and they all connect to the same IRC server, and then you could do stuff with that. Um, and what you start to see around that time is highly infectious viruses spreading to the, to the tune of millions and millions. Please don't tell me. Okay, good. I need to remain in compliance. Sorry. Pause. <laughs> Let's comply. Um, and so uh, you would see these explosions of malware in, in the early 2000s because you would get malware that spreads really quickly. And uh, because it's connected to some kind of command and control server or it downloads part of its, uh, um, its payload, these would be hard-coded into the malware. And when you block an IOC back then, you blocked the malware. So they would just go all the way up to like 11 million uh, infections, and then they would disappear a month later, which is really interesting. But these developed from these worming viruses that could connect to a server. You start to see the modern botnet emerge throughout the late 2000s, or be between 2005 to 2010. And again, this grows the sense of purpose that malware now has. It's not just something that could delete your files or, or make a, a fart noise on your machine. Now you could create a huge network of computers and you can tell them to DDoS somebody all at the same time. And you could start to, maybe you sell that capability to other people, you could start to make money. A lot of these would create spam, so they would use proxies or computers to send spam everywhere and you could pay for that suddenly you could make money on, on, your, on your botnet. And that was a huge evolution, and you start to see from that the first emergence of cybercrime. But these are, these are, there's you know, a, lot of, a lot of botnets emerging at this time, and one of the ways that botnets would remain active is they would have to iterate. Because if you block a, a, an IOC, it would be difficult. If you uh, find their signature, it would be difficult for them to spread. So they start to iterate, and they iterate quickly. The name of the game in this later part of uh, between 2005 to 2010 was iteration. New versions would come out so quickly that you would start to see conversations happening between malware writers and writers of NT uh, or researchers, security researchers. This is near bot, and throughout uh, the, I think it was 2005, throughout 2005, Whoever wrote this, with every new iteration, would write a new comment for researchers to find, and it would just basically be a conversation. The gist of it is he wanted it to be called Ironbot, and everybody else was calling it Nearbot, and they just continued to call it Nearbot, probably to kind of annoy him. And throughout this, he's saying a lot of not nice things about security researchers, but they would iterate very quickly. And 2010, to 2020, we, uh, we start to see the sort of evolution of what we know as modern malware. Um, one of the big things that happens in 2012 was, is the creation of Bitcoin. And another thing that happens is, is Eternal Blue in 2017, and with it, WannaCry. Why these two things are important is because um, Bitcoin gives people a way to monetize on their malware that is a lot harder to detect. No more. Uh, gift cards or vouchers, which they, they, they would then have to resell. And uh, it's a huge problem, and they could be tracked back. Now you could work with Bitcoin. It was a lot more effective. Vulnerabilities gave you access to a lot more. Computers are more networked now than ever before, and so you could use these vulnerabilities to get, gain a crazy amount of access. And so when you think about the next part in the evolution of malware, and I know that this is now getting a little simplified, because when, I, when, when you do the research into the, the history of malware, you start out really sort of narrow. You start with like MS-DOS viruses, and it's all pretty simple, and then it kind of grows a little bit, and then it grows again, and then it becomes exponential. So I'm having to simplify a little bit. But we start to see the phenomenon of these botnets um, developing more and more complex backdoors, um, which leads to more and more monetization of these botnets. And we, like I said, start out with spam and uh, DDoS. But 
it's not, uh, it doesn't take too long for these uh, botnets to start using backdooring capabilities like key logging and password uh, um, credential harvesting and so on. And we see the first uh, um, uh, banking trojans sort of come into the scene where the goal is to steal, uh, steal banking information. And then finally, um, dropping a, a ransomware. When you're done with this, this endpoint, when you have no more use for it, you drop a ransomware on it. Uh, this was first done with CryptoLocker um, in 2013, 2012, 2013, and the Zeus uh, botnet. So Zeus was a very famous botnet at the time, and they were basically when they didn't need the, the malware anymore, or the, the endpoint anymore, they would just drop uh, ransomware on it. Eventually, just like uh, every time in the history of, of uh, cybersecurity, uh, you start to see, first you see attacks against people, and then that moves into organizations. Eventually, these attacks that were mostly targeting people move to organizations, and I show the slide, for example, uh, uh, you know, WannaCry and uh, others like it really show the world that ransomware can be an infection that is uh, really, really hard to stop, both for individuals and for companies. So I know I'm kind of rushing through the later part, but I feel like we've all lived through more modern malware, and I kind of want to focus on the history. So I'm sorry, I'm simplifying here a lot, right? But I wanted to kind of show you my train of thought. Um, you know, in the early days, imagine kind of the 80s right here, and then the kind of late 90s, and then finally uh, 2000s. We start with uh, viruses, just regular MS-DOS uh, viruses. There were a lot of those. There were a few worms, and there were a few Trojans, but there were a lot of viruses. And then we start to see the macro virus in 95, so that's an evolution there. And then when you start to get the, put the sort of internet into the picture, you start to see macro viruses that worm around uh, the world, that spread themselves. At the same time, Trojans develop, and we start to see backdooring capabilities develop in a lot of different malware. And so when you combine those two, you actually form uh, botnets. And then from botnets, you start to see uh, the, the sort of development of Trojans, of, of uh, banking Trojans, and uh, ransomware. That's kind of it, I guess. Obviously, there's a lot more to this story. Um, but of course, now we're dealing with, with a lot of other things uh, uh, in the corporate world. But when I thought, think about malware specifically, that's kind of where I want to trace this journey. So the last thing that I have to ask myself is, is okay, when I was doing research for this, um, it's a lot of reading, it's really fun, but it's also really uh, a lot of reading. And you try to make connections and you try to figure out, all right, what was the technology that showed up around that time that seems to have enabled what's going on throughout this period? And I thought to myself, if I write this 20 years from now and look back, what would be the thing that, uh, that I see as the, as the driving factor for malware that are going to be created, let's say, in the 2020s. And it seems to me that AI might be something that, that uh, uh, would play a big role. And I don't know how, if, if this is correct or if it's not correct, but the way to sort of know this is maybe to follow the same pattern that we see throughout the development of malware throughout the years. What we're going to start to see is uh, some concepts. We're going to start to see something experimental come out. And to be fair, I think those things already exist. I think we're kind of past the experimental stage in a lot of ways. There's already AI uh, or language models that could write malware. Um, not just phishing, but write malware. Um, so the question is, is this going to get to, to develop into something serious? And I think first thing we'll see is, is concepts, uh, proof of concept. And I'm wondering if one day we'll see this vision of Alexander Dudney of two software, two AI software creations fighting it out inside a computer uh, when we have you know, the malware writers and the, a and the security people just kind of building their own AIs to kind of battle it out. And that's kind of a, 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 an exciting future and also very uh, creepy, I would say. But it, it might happen, and I think the, the one thing that it's important to take away from this history is to never say never. A lot of these things start out in concepts, 
This happened with the, the concept uh, macro worm. This happened with a lot of the early worms that, that were being created. People didn't pay attention. They thought this, this is not going to be a thing. This is not going to cause any harm. But never say never. Um, and so I think this might be the next stage. There's, there's so much more to the history of malware. There's so much, so many more stories that I wish I could tell you, uh, that I wish I could share with you. Um, I've put a lot of different links, and, and uh, as you can see, every slide has, has different links for you to go and read uh, for yourself. I don't know if we'll be sharing slides later on. There's so much information out there, and I encourage you to go and read about it yourself. I hope this was good. I hope this was interesting. I hope this, this, this uh, invigorated your desire to learn about the history of Malin. And thank you for much, uh, so much for bearing with me. We're at time, but if anybody wants to ask any questions, yeah, go ahead. What viruses uh, have you heard about? I mean, OK, yeah, I think. Yeah, I'll repeat it. So what, what is my opinion about metaviruses and, and AR viruses? So there's a, um, shoot, what was, what's the name of the book um, with Hero? Uh, is it Snow Crash? Snow Crash, right? There was a virus that would infect your VR glasses and would alter your brain, right? I mean, I think. I don't have an opinion. I'm not qualified to make an opinion about the future of, of VR. But could, this is a good example of some technology that's being developed uh, and might seem innocuous or might seem, um, might seem uh, 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 safe and harmless. And then you start to see people abusing it for, for different purposes. That's something that we might see. And again, to find out if that's an actual reality that might happen, we need to look for the, uh, you know, for these first, uh, the, the canaries in the, in the coal mine, kind of. These first proofs of concept of a virus in a VR headset. I don't know, isn't it interesting what you might be able to do with something like that? I think we can do one more question. Yeah. Getting messed up, sir. So I kind of got a joke out of the, the macro viruses because so many companies still use macros. Yes. Right? And so that's not really an old tech. It's an old technology, but it's still really valid. Yes. But we rely so much and developers lie, rely so much on like shared code. Mm -hmm. So direct system calls, you know, uh, mm -hmm. click once applications, direct handlers. Mm -hmm. Why as a group have we not just gone to Microsoft and that and said, just stop it? Right? I mean, because at some point, we have. I mean, there's so many things that are built in that use click once, right? Two things. And there's so many vulnerabilities we can take advantage of, which is great. But it's not good for the world, you know? Oh, so we have. So there's two things I can say about this. One is security researchers are always at the forefront of telling people, uh, oh, I should put this on my, oh, my slide, by the way, if anybody's interested. Um, Security researchers are always on the forefront of telling uh, corporate people that stop, <laughs> like, put some, some defenses into what you're doing. So if you read through, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of great archives for magazines, uh, like Virus Bulletin, for example, when it actually used to be a bulletin in the 80s, 90s. Um, and security researchers are, do warn about the, the dangers, and uh, specifically with macros, this has been something that Microsoft has promised to block off starting from 1995 or 1996 when, when you start to see these, uh, uh, the concept virus and other viruses come up. So it's, you can read about it in, in, during those days. They're, they're, it's something that's repeated that Microsoft was supposed to solve the problem, I believe, in 96, and then they didn't because they didn't want to break anything. And then they were supposed to shut it off later on, and then they, they didn't actually. Macroviruses actually kind of fell off the face of the earth on their own because, because uh, people didn't want to open attachments. And uh, it, everybody started compiling their macros. Um, and then they just made a comeback towards the end. So we have, we have they, just don't, they just didn't listen. And, and now I think, I think 
now Microsoft is somehow blocking macros. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there, there's the warning, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, just wondering uh, about the diagram you had of the classification of uh, different threats. Yeah. I was just wondering where do you think threats like Petya uh, fit into that, things that essentially are ransomware but also have a destructive purpose, get rid of the master boot record? Good question. Very good question. Look, a, a lot of malware today, if you look at an attack cycle, it will have a lot of these components coming in through. So the, the thing that really dawned on me that was really interesting, because I've always known and, and I worked with a lot of researchers, um, you see, often you see phishing start with a document and then it runs, uh, um, it runs a macro and that macro maybe will run a PowerShell command and that would start the whole infection chain. And yeah, I always thought, okay, macros, right? Phishing goes to macro. And one thing that kind of dawned on me as I was working on this, hey, that's a virus actually, because the macro is, is sort of appended to or infected onto the, uh, um, the, the file itself. And so a lot of this history still exists through a modern attack cycle. I don't know exactly how Petya works, but if I had to generalize and maybe think maybe through phishing, do you have the answer? Yeah, yeah. So maybe, you know, you, you do the phishing, you run the macro, you download something. Um, that something probably acts as some remote access uh, tool or, or remote access trojan, gives you some backdooring activity, you start to, you, you know, you continue to operate in, in the network, download the payload and install it. The only, th I think one of the, the bigger differences between Petya and other uh, um, ransomware is that from my understanding, Petya does work in, in the uh, master boot record. So I think when it runs, it, it will run. I think it, it, I can't recall if it starts to encrypt files already, but it would at some point ask you to reboot. Like wipers, yeah, yeah. So if I, if, I, if I had to, if I had more time, like if this was a two-parter or something like that, then I would probably go more into yeah, proceed, talk about wipers, maybe talk about web applications as applications and how threats sort of get into those areas and how maybe the genealogy exists there. Talk about the web and the evolution of the web. Talk about exploit kits and, you know, how different programs like Java and Flash enabled people to just infect, uh, you know, drive-by downloads, just infect people. I think there's, there's a lot more to talk about. It's a, but this is kind of the... The base of it. All right, Can last I? one. Yeah, we have to break for lunch. I don't know. This is just a build on what he was already asking. But one of the things I was thinking about was, um, what about viruses that um, jump from like you know cyber to physical that you know actually can reprogram or you know like in with industrial control systems reprogram machines to destroy themselves? Something like with uh, Stuxnet and such. So you're thinking about like something like Stuxnet. Yeah. So you were saying what about viruses that that ah. Uh, Come out of it, the virus. Yeah, virtual. but but their um their purpose is, is is entirely like you know it'll sit and wait and make sure it's on the right machine in the right place and then because um, it's you know it's targeting a particular system in a particular place and the object is to destroy something physical and possibly cause physical harm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's um, of course so. No, not not you know not sure what the question is. But, but that, that is something that I saw popping up throughout the, the history. There's this, there's this story and that uh, the first instance of something like that happening was in, I think, 82 or something like that, which is not a very credible account. And it was the US uh, infecting some kind of a Russian con, uh, control system for a gas pipeline. Um, yeah, Stuxnet was the, the, the coolest one of those. But well, what would be your question? What would you want to? Um, I guess, like, how do you see that playing out? I mean, this is this is all part of sort of the cyber war, the activity that nation states are doing. I mean, I think this is going to continue to play out. I I don't think that yeah, most of this kind of evolves into what I'm talking about evolves into cybercrime, but 
This is definitely a side of cybersecurity that. Maybe you guys can talk offline. Yeah, yeah come. Thank you. Come chat with that me. That was really you want. great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. That's great for lunch.